Okay, so last uh, in last week we spoke about the difference between a biological neural network and an artificial neural network, right? So can somebody tell me what's the basic concept be behind a biological neural network and how does it differ from a artificial neural network and what are the similarities and what are the differences? Yeah, so that's called this. What is that called? That's called the point of singularity, right? You must have heard about that being talked about not only in science fiction, but even some of the gurus of, of AI these days are talking about the you know singularity. The singularity is a point theoretically in AI when uh, you know AI becomes so powerful that it can actually create improved AI. It doesn't need human beings to improve the AI. All right. So it's like uh, it's a it's a turning point where actually we humans become obsolete, right? So we don't know if that's going to actually occur, but that's a theoretical concept that you know, robots can actually generate better robots. You don't need to have human beings to be able to, to do that. So that, that, you know, we don't know if that's going to ever occur. There are some futures who, who predict that might occur by 2050, all right? So perhaps some of you guys will see it. If, <laughs> yeah, but you see, every time, uh, every time uh, uh, something, uh, AI takes off, and this is not just for AI, for every technology, there is a hype curve. I mean, you're all familiar with the hype curve, right? So if I draw the hype curve over here, um, the hype curve basically says that, uh, right? So, so your hype curve basically says that um, if you look at time and uh, so-called hype in terms of how popular technology is. So typically it starts off and it goes up and up and up and then there is some kind of a downturn, and then eventually there is some kind of a plateau, right? So this generally is lower than this. You know, you could say that uh, perhaps this is somewhere uh, it goes down over here and then comes up over here. So uh, a lot of technologies, even when AI initially came up in the 60s, it went through a hype curve, right? And people thought that this would keep on going forever. So, you know, people think that it's going to keep on going forever. But what happens is that after a certain point, people realize there are limitations, okay? And eventually those limitations force the, the curve to actually start going down, the expectations start to slow down. And eventually actually there's some disillusionment as well. People realize that you know, this technology is not what it's all hyped up to be. And then there is, you know, people start leaving it and you know, there's, you know, everybody starts forgetting about that research. But at some point people realize that, you no, know, wait a second, there, there is some level of satisfaction. And then the industry starts picking up and the industry starts to actually utilize those technologies. And so then there is a second uh, you know, uh, interest and then there's a leveling off, right? So this is the plateau where people actually realize the potential of a new technology. But this is a hype which is very well established in the industry. It happens for almost every technology. And if you look at the hype curve today, um, for the, the current technologies, whether it's AI, whether it's deep learning, whether it's sensor networks, or in, any other technology, you'll find that there's a hype curve for it and you can find out where you are. Uh, it's generally a good idea to re start working on, on uh, research topics, if you're doing your PhD especially, which are somewhere in this particular region, right? Why is that? Because um, you know, if, you're, if you're doing it over here, it's very hard to publish. So it's a good idea to, to pick up, it's easier to publish in this region because everybody's excited about it. Uh, at this particular point, people start forgetting about it. It's hard to publish and you know, it's hard to find jobs as well in the industry if, you, if, you, uh, if, you, if you've done research or your main um, you know, asset is a technology which is on the downward trend. But eventually, uh, this, this does stabilize, okay? So as you were talking about that AI had its hype, it's had its hype several times. The first time it had its hype was in the 60s and 70s. And then for, there was this long, as they call it, the, the winter, the AI winter, where nothing was happening and you, people forget, said that you know, AI is not gonna do anything. And then there was a second hype and this happened about, as I said, about 2010, 2008, 12. And that happened because of deep learning, because as I said, you know, the, the uh, data became, you had big data. At the same time, you had, hardware which could actually support solutions, all right? And you had algorithms. You had algorithms which were actually able to uh, solve problems. 
And so uh, there was a second hype. And then we, right now, uh, deep learning is probably somewhere over here. All right. It's gone through the second hype, uh, probably around 2019. It started going down. All right. People said that, you know, deep learning is, is again a fad. It's not going to be, uh, it's not going to, you know, find solutions forever. And so 2019, 20, even today, a lot of people will speak negatively of deep learning, all right? Because they think that it's not really what it's all hyped up to be. But people uh, who have been, who are serious researchers in this say that, you know, most of the key uh, AI, uh, you know, trends that are coming in, most of the key technologies which are being used, uh, we talked about all those technologies, those are still using deep learning, all right? So uh, we expect that it will go down and then we'll come up again. And that's uh, common for every, every technology. And so um, if you're talking about, you know, um, uh, you know the, the singularity, well, it may or may not happen, all right? So, um, but you, you'll see these ups and downs uh, in this technology all the time. So uh, we, we, uh, we took a look, uh, a brief review of last week's lecture. And as you very um, appropriately summarized everything, I think people are online missed it. But basically, we said that biological neural networks and artificial neural networks are fairly similar, all right? There is some similarity, but of course, ANN is a very simplistic form of a biological neural network, right? Uh, biological neural networks are far more complex. The kind of interaction that happens, happens in a synapse, actually, we don't really know. It's extremely complicated. If you talk to a neuroscientist, they'll give you, you know, uh, a year-long lecture, <laughs> perhaps, on how, new, how synapses actually work. So this is a very simplistic version of it. But uh, there are some similarities in the sense that the output Y over here uh, of, a, of an axion is basically what we're referring to Y, the output of an artificial neural network, right? So this is a single perceptron over here that I've shown over here. It's a single neuron. And uh, it has a, a function F, which we defined earlier, which was, um, which was a simple summation, a weighted sum of the inputs, just like you had over here. And then you had an, uh, a bias as well. So the bias is sort of similar to the bias that you see over here that you may require a little bit of an extra, the, the input has to sum up to a certain level before it triggers the output. Okay, so that the bias does that. And then there is a very important aspect, which is a non-linear function, non-linear activation function, okay? This is extremely critical to uh, deep neural networks. If you don't have non-linearity in that, um, this entire um, you know, algorithm, this entire framework fails, okay? So non-linearity is extremely important as we'll see today. Uh, this is where we, we finished off last time. And now um, what I'd like to do is um, talk about um, how a simple uh, perceptron problem, a sim simple perceptron, um, can be applied to solve uh, perhaps a real world problem, okay? And we'll talk about a classification algorithm. And the idea is that suppose that you had, um, suppose that you had two types of, you know, it could be animals. So let's take, for example, uh, cats and dogs, our favorite two animals. And you had some way, some, um, some attributes of those, animals, right? It could be, for example, you could say that you have uh, what could be two attributes which differentiates dogs and cats. Dogs are not that popular here, but sorry. So, so, the, so the kind of bark, all right? So you could say the volume of the, the strength of the, of the bark or of the, uh, you know, the sound. So it could be the, the cat is a lot softer, it's, you know, in terms of decibels, it's a lot smaller, and the dog barks a lot louder, right? So that could be one feature. What could be other features that differentiates? Sorry? Space, okay, so, uh, so we're trying to make it simple right now. What could be a simple way to measure a space? Sorry? The size of the animal, so it could be the size, all right? So you could simply measure the size and you could say in feet, 
uh, is this uh, you know you know 21 centimeters or 30 centimeters or whatever all right and there could be um, you know there's unlimited number of features that you could think about which differentiates these two animals but let's uh, make it simple and we'll talk about two features all right so it could be the volume it could be something else it could be simply the size the length or the height let's say the height and it could be the weight for example all right you could make it really simple um, these are two features that you could say uh, perhaps can differentiate these two animals. All right. Now, the idea is that we take a bunch of data from real world animals. All right. And we put it on this two dimensional uh, graph. And then we try to see if we can use a perceptron uh, to be able to uh, classify, to help us classify these two animals. All right. And of course, um, we will require some kind of a training, right? So as, as you said, these weights will have to be trained. Initially, if you start the perceptron off and you say that, well, we don't know what the weight should be to be able to classify these two animals, um, you could start it off by, by choosing random weights, okay? But at some point, as you feed it more and more data, as you give it more and more data about cats and dogs, and you say, and you find out eventually that, for example, most of the cats uh, will have, uh, let's say, their, their heights will be hopefully shorter, all right? So if, you look, if you've got a bunch of cats, uh, their weights, um, their heights may be smaller, all right? And their weights will probably be smaller as well. They'll be less in white, weight, right? So most of the cats are probably going to be somewhere in this region, okay? Where will the dogs be? Well, they'll be a little taller, right? And they'll hopefully be a, uh, you know, a little heavier as well. So most of the dogs could be somewhere over here. All right. Yes. So, so absolutely. So you could have exceptions. You could have very small dogs, right? So you may have once in a while, you may have a dog over here, which is extremely small. It could be a poodle. And on the other hand, you could have a, maybe a, a, you know, a Persian cat. Some of my cousins in the U.S. have these cats which are huge, you know, absolutely huge. I mean, you weigh, you pick it up, and you feel like you, it's uh, you know an elephant. So you could have cats over here as well, which are extremely heavy. But let's take a very simple case, and let's assume that you have, and this will be a more complex case which we will look at as we go along. But let's assume that we start off with a very simple case. We say that we have three cases, or three cats, which are all over here and three dogs which are over here all right so this is the simple case now the now the issue is that um that's the time for prayer today so you will stop in a few minutes uh so the issue is that can we use this data to somehow train our perceptron okay so um how do you think you could do that how would you start it off how would you actually try to Figure out what's the what's the basic issue that we're trying to resolve in terms of the perceptron. If you go back to the there's a single perceptron. What is it that we need to figure out, and how would we do it? Any ideas? Sorry. So we need to find the threshold above which uh, perhaps the 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 sum you could say the sum of the weight and the and the height uh, are above a certain threshold. And they're below a certain threshold, we would say that it's a cat. If it's above a certain threshold, we would say it's a dog, right? So what we could do is we could choose um, this particular sum, all right? We could have a, a weighted sum. What could you choose as a starting point for weights? Should we use uh, different weights or could we just say x1 plus x2, as long as they're roughly equivalent, right? So if it's in centimeters, and that's also, uh, you know, the weight is in, let's say, kilograms. We may have to weight it uh, so that they're somewhat, uh, you know, similar in, in numbers, right? So we could start off by saying that, let's assume the weights are one, okay? So we could say that these weights are going to be one, and we're simply going to have a function, the F, which is equal to X1 plus X2. And then the question is, do we need to have a bias or not? All right? But that depends on how we're choosing the, the, um, the non-linear function. Now, what kind of non-linear function would you want to choose? So your idea is perfectly right. You would say that, let's say x1 plus x2 
is above a certain value, right? So the above value, for example, depending on what the numbers are, the, the value could be, let's say, 10 or 100, all right? That would determine the value of the which parameter, the weights or the bias. If let's say we want the, the numbers to sum up to a number bigger than 100, then uh, should that number 100 uh, be reflected in the weights or in the bias? In the bias, right? So we would say that the sum of these two has to be larger than a certain value, let's say 100. And then what would our, our nonlinear activation function be? Okay, so we want to say, let's say that our y, we want to make it zero if it's a cat, all right? And you want to make it a one if it's a dog, all right? So it's a step function. We're trying to decide whether uh, it should be, it's, a, it's a cat or a dog. So what we could say is that if the value of f is above a certain value, let's say above, above, above zero, all right? We're using a simple step function, which is something like this. We're using a step, step function, which is going like this, all right? So in other words, if f is uh, less than or equal to zero, we want to make it zero. If f is greater than, z greater than zero, we want to choose it to be a one, all right? So um, what would we want to make f equal to? Can you think of how f could be constructed? So let's say the weights are one. So it's x1 plus x2. Now we want to make it, we want to set the bias such that when it's, um, when it's a dog, the value, of, um, the value of y, the value of f is greater than zero. So what should the bias be? Should it be plus 100 or should it be a negative number? It should be a negative number, right? So basically what we want to do is we want to say f is equal to uh, x1 plus x2 minus 100, right? In other words, if the sum of the two minus 100 is greater than zero, then we want the y value to be one, which means that basically it's a dog. If the, the sum of the two is less than 100, then it has to be, a, then, it's, then y is going to be zero, which means that it's going to be a cat, okay? So that's the basic idea that we want to do, all right? So this was uh, a rough idea. Now um, let's break for prayers, and then we'll look at a very specific example and try to see how the numbers add up, okay? So I'm going to stop the, uh, just a quick check um, for those of you who are online. Um, can, um, Abdullah, can you tell me if uh, the, you're able to hear us properly? You'll have to unmute your mic and let me know if you, if you can hear. Yes, 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 sir. Yes, I can, yes. You're following the lecture? Good. Uh, Aves, yes, um, sir, yes. are you also following the lecture? Okay, good. So I'm going to now stop and we'll take about a 15 minute break. Come back at um, 625, 35, at 6.40, okay. Stopping the share and Right, so um, 6.40, we shall be now resuming our session. So uh, how's the homework uh, coming? How did the uh, homework come along? I think most of you have submitted it. Any issues, problems? Okay, good, good. Uh, the homework assignment as compared to the rest of the semester? Uh, <laughs> okay. So this is to get you started. And uh, let's see how, how people perform.
we'll uh, manage the homework assignments also based on people's feedback. Okay, so um, now let's take a look at a specific example. Um, right. Let me see if my Okay, so here's an example of the same problem. So we've got uh, two um, attributes, x1 and x2, height and weight, and we've got a bunch of labeled data, right? So this is data that is already labeled. We know that uh, the first three instances, these three um, animals are all cats. We know that these are all dogs. This is prior information. And let's assume K, uh, these are some units. Uh, let's say the first uh, value is 2, 2, which means that the height and the, the weight are both 2, 2. So this is the first uh, value. The second value is 5 and 2. Uh, the third value is 2 and 5. And these three are all cats. All right. Um, then we've got um, a bunch of dogs. We've got 10, 5, uh, 10, 10 and 5, 10, so these are the three larger animals with bigger weight and height, and these are the dogs, all right? Now the question is, K, what should the values of uh, the weights and what should be the bias be over here, okay? So based on what we know from uh, simple uh, as, uh, mathematics, can we figure out what would be the value what would be what should be the values and where should we draw the line? So if you had to actually use a simple graph and to be able to differentiate between these two, what would you do? You'd simply draw a, a, a straight line, right? And the straight line obviously goes somewhere over here. So uh, let's say that we draw a line somewhere over here, all right, which goes through hopefully around these two points, uh, 10, 0 and 0, 10, okay? So, um, if you want to have a line which goes straight through that, and you want to have a function where we say that f um, is basically zero for that particular line, and we want to have a step function that we spoke about earlier, all right? So here's a step function, which is um, y, okay? So y is a step function of f, all right? So here's f on the horizontal axis, and the equation for f is f is equal to summation of w i x i plus a bias, right? And the equation for y is that it is some nonlinear function of f. In this particular case, the nonlinear function is simply we want to use a step function, a step function, all right? And that's going to be a zero for f less than or equal to zero and one for f greater than zero. Right. In other words, uh, when it's one, uh, clearly that's going to be a dog, and this is when it's a zero. When y is equal to zero, then we want to classify it as a cat. All right. So the question is that what should be the values of w for each one of the two weights? So this is w one over here, right? This is w two over here. What should be the weights and what should be the value of the bias? Okay. Um, for this classification, single perceptron based classification system to actually work. People remember your mathematics, right? Simple um, algebra and stuff like that, right? So uh, if, you want to, if you want to use this particular classification, so let's say that in other words, we want this part to be cats and we want this part to be dogs, right? If you want this part to be dogs and this part to be cats, then, and, and our basic classification system is that when F is greater than or equal to zero, right? When F is greater than zero, we want it to be dogs, right? So in other words, this portion, for this portion, what does F have to be? F has to be greater than zero. So over here, F has to be greater than zero. Over here, what does F have to be? Less than zero, right? So um, less than or equal to zero. So on this particular line, what is the value of f? This particular line is the equation where f is equal to zero. Is that clear so far? 
ठीक है If that's the line for f is equal to zero, can we write an equation for that? Can we write an equation? What is uh, the equation for f? F is basically this particular sum, right? So what we want to do is we want to make this equal to zero for that particular line. Is everybody following me? This particular line is f is equal to zero. The equation for f is this. So essentially, what we want to do is we want to make Uh, w1 x1 plus w2 x2 um, plus the bias equal to zero for this particular line. All right. Now, can somebody tell me what the equation of that line would be? Where w1 plus well, I'll make it simple for you. Let's assume that uh, w1 and w2 are both one. Okay. In other words, we're not giving. You can see from from the system from The graph over here that it's somewhat symmetric in terms of x1 and x2, right? So you don't, you don't, you wouldn't expect that the weight of one should be higher than the other because you, because it's very symmetric, all right? The weights of x, uh, if you look at this equation, it's completely symmetric in terms of x1 and x2, right? If it's symmetric in terms of x1 and x2, you would guess that the weights of both of them would be equal. You want to weight each one of them equally, all right? Uh, having Set the weights. Now the question is, what should be the bias? So now what we want is an equation where x1 plus x2 plus a bias is equal to zero for this particular line. Now that's making it as simple as you can think of, right? You all done a little bit of maths, forgotten the maths? Okay. Sorry. Bias is going to be equal to 10 minus 10. Who said minus 10? Okay. So you have to remember the mathematics. So it's going to be the equation is going to be x1 plus x2 is equal to 10, right? In other words, the bias is going to be negative 10. Why is that? Because you can very simply see that the equation for that line is x1 plus x2 is equal to 10. Uh, when when x1 is 10 and x2 is 0, clearly you get you get this particular point. When x1 is 0 and x2 is equal to 10, you get this particular point, and it's a linear equation, so it's going through that line, right? So now we found out that for this particular set of data, if we have w1 and w2 equal to one, and we have the bias equal to minus 10, then this is a sim simple perceptron which can actually classify this set of data between dogs and cats. Now, take some time, Agi. All right. Any questions? Any questions from people who are Online. Tuba has also joined. Uh, let me just make sure that. So we, we've got the. Um, the the simple perceptron problem resolved in terms of being able to classify this particular problem between cats and dogs, right? Uh, now the question is: Okay, uh, how do we get the values of W1, W2, and beta and B? Right. We, we right now it was fairly simple. We simply had we could see the data and we could draw a line through it. But imagine that you didn't have two features. Imagine that you had two hundred features, right? Um, And it wasn't a simple problem. It uh, this is what is referred to as a linearly separable problem, right? Why is it linearly separable? Because because you can separate it by a straight line, right? So so you need you can simply draw a straight line and you can differentiate all the data, right? So this is a linearly separable problem. But the earlier problem that we referred to, where we said, okay, it's possible that some of the dogs might be over here. You could have a poodle over here. Some of the cats might be over here as well. You know, you could have a large cat. So then the problem becomes non-linearly separable, right? So there, you can't draw a straight line. Then what? What would you look be looking for? Suppose you had this data and you wanted to differentiate between dogs and cats. Um, how would you do it? Sorry. Some kind of a curve, right? So it would be very tricky because here, if I if I try to draw a curve. Uh, maybe I'll use a green line. So you're looking for a curve, something like this. All right, because this is where all the dogs are, 
and the ones who are outside the green circle would actually become cats, okay? So this is a non-linearly separable problem. And the question is, how would you solve that? Now, um, this is where the non-linear activation comes in, all right? If you don't have a non-linear activation function somewhere in your neural network, you will not be able to have these non-linearities built in, okay? So um, we're going to do this uh, next. Um, now let's, let's just plug in the values over here. Hopefully this is fairly straightforward. So two plus two, you have four and you have a bias of negative 10. So the value becomes negative six. This is less than zero, so y becomes zero. This is five, six, seven, minus three. This becomes zero, five, six, seven, minus three. This becomes zero. This is 15 minus 10. This becomes a five, so this is a one. 20, um, sorry, 10 and this becomes a one, and this becomes five, so this becomes a one, right? So you can see how I calculated that. I simply plugged in the equation, and I said, what's the value of f given that the bias is minus 10, all right? So you, we've resolved this particular problem. Now let's look at the slightly more difficult problem, okay? A more complex problem, and now let's see that you have a bunch of data, all right? You've got, let's say, cats over here, and you have dogs over here, and let's say you have cats over here, all right? So the question is, can you, uh, is this particular problem and a slim, simpler version of this, which is referred to as the XOR problem, all right? An XOR problem. Uh, people remember gates, you're all hopefully computer scientists, most of you remember your gates, the AND gates, OR gates, NOR gates, XOR gates. So what does an XOR function look like? Uh, XOR basically says that if you have X1 and X2, or let me put it over here, X1, X2, and the output, um, when this is zero, zero, you have a zero, you have a zero, one, you have a one, a one, zero, you have a one, and a one, one would have a zeros. So this is your XOR function, okay, XOR. So in other words, uh, this is sort of similar to the cats and dogs problem where you have this particular issue that you have dogs in the middle and then you have some cats who are much larger and some, most of the cats are, are, some cats are smaller, some cats are very large and in the middle you have dogs, okay? So this could be represented as a much simpler problem. You could say that you have zero over here, a zero over here, those are the two cats categories and you have the ones in the middle which are the dogs, okay? And the question is, how could you solve this problem? Now, first of all, is this linearly separable? Okay, up can I get this is linearly separable? Elaborate, why do you say it's linearly separable? Okay, so you can draw two lines. Uh, you could essentially say this is one linear li line and this is another linear line. And you could say that, you know, everything which is over here and here is uh, our cats and things which are in this particular region are dogs, okay? So um, this is, you know, I don't know how you, how you label it. Um, you could say this is partially linearly separable because you could draw two lines, all right? But in simplistic uh, terms, this is not linearly separable because you can't draw a single line. You need multiple lines because, you know, if I look at this earlier problem, um, this particular, um, there was that, this particular problem, if I use your logic, I could say this is also linearly separable. Why? Because I could use a whole bunch of the straight lines and it flows that. I could say that, well, actually there are, there's a line over here and there's a line over here and then there's a line over here. Sorry, a line over here. So if it's under this line and on this line, then it's a dog. If it's over here and here, then it's a dog. If it's not in there, it's a cat, right? So you could actually draw an infinite number of lines, straight line, and then convert it into a linearly separable problem. But that's not how we call it. Linear separable is very simple. Can you draw a single line which separates all of it? And if not, then it's a non-linear problem. Okay, so let's keep it simple. That's how I'm defining it. Perhaps other people have defined it differently. But I'll define this as a non-linearly separable problem. Um, so the question is, um, how do we solve it? Now, can we use 
a single perceptron to solve this problem? Can we use a single perceptron, which is simply x1, x2, x1, x2, w1, w2, and a y, and a nonlinear function over here, which I'll refer to as a, as a phi, all right? Can we use the same um, concept and somehow able to solve this problem? You think that from your, there's a lot of intuition in this field, all right? So you have to think about your intuition, your gut feeling. Do you think this is your, does your intuition tell you that you can solve this problem, this particular XOR problem using a single perceptron? All right, so this is a single perceptron. Do you think you can do it? Sorry, no. Anybody thinks they can do it? What if we uh, use some kind of a fancy uh, non-linear uh, non activation? Suppose that here is a, a linear activation, all right? Um, Suppose that this is my step function, right? I could use uh, any nonlinear function, right? I haven't, I haven't said that the step function is the only nonlinear function. I could draw a whole bunch of step uh, nonlinear activation functions. Uh, the important thing in the nonlinear activation functions is that um, when, when x, when this f over here is very small, it has to go to zero, and at some point it has to go to one. It has to be between zero and one, right? Because we're doing a binary, binary classification. It's either as a dog or a cat. We're not saying we have uh, three categories. We're not saying that we have 100 categories. We're simply saying dogs and cats, okay? Not goats, okay? So if we, this is a binary classification problem, you want to either have a zero or one, okay? Now I could use a, a different function. I could use what is referred to as um, a, a, linear, a, a ReLU function. This is referred to as ReLU, okay? ReLU stands for a, a rectified linear unit. Rectified uh, linear unit, all right? So basically if you write, if you think of this, can somebody tell me the equation for this? Uh, y is equal to what of f? Can somebody tell me an equation for this? Yeah, so you could write that as the following. Y is equal to max zero comma f. Does that make sense? So if y is neg if f is negative, then zero is greater than f, so it will, the output will be zero. If F is positive, then the output will be F. Okay, so this is what is referred to as a, as a linear uh, rectifier. And this is one of the popular, in fact, a very popular um, uh, nonlinear activation uh, that is used in most of deep learning, all right, because of its simplicity. There's another uh, equation which is used, which is called a sigmoid equation, all right? Sigmoid. Uh, sigmoid looks something like this. It goes up till one, and in the middle it is zero. All right, so as f goes to infinity, it goes to one. As f goes to minus infinity, it goes to zero. But in the middle it is, it is 0 0.5. So it looks something like this. Okay. And the equation for this is uh, one plus e to the power minus f, okay? So you can tell as f goes to in infinity, this becomes one. F as f goes to negative infinity, the denominator blows up and it becomes zero. When f is equal to zero, uh, e to the power zero is what? One, anything to the power zero is one. So it becomes one upon two, which becomes 0 0.5, okay? So these are different nonlinear activation functions. So I could use any one of them. So the question is, if I use some of these fancy nonlinear activation functions, do you think that uh, we can solve this, we can still solve this problem? Now, now honestly, I'm asking you a tough question, all right? Uh, I don't expect you to actually know the answer, but these are things that you should think about, all right? And I'll give you, um, I'll, I'll take you to a website uh, shortly. 
uh, which is called Tensor um, Playground. I don't know if anybody has seen that before. So we look at that, and there you can actually experiment with all of this. It's a lot of fun. Okay, we'll take a look at that. But uh, coming back to this particular problem, let's, uh, I'll show you a particular solution to this problem and see whether it can solve this problem, all right? But it will not be using a single perceptron, okay? It will it'll be using a multi-layer multi perceptron, all right? So here's the solution. And this solution was worked out um, in chapter 6.1 of Iron, Go uh, Iron Goodwill. So if you have the book, and I'll start giving you some preliminary chapters to read. I think chapter one is very interesting, and chapter six is interesting, and you can look at it in between. But generally, it does a very thorough, um, uh, you know, it does the same thing, but in an extremely mathematical and a thorough way. So some of you might, it might just go over your head. And I don't expect all of you to spend so much ma time on mathematics because it's a more of an applied uh, course. But do look at the, the book, and it, it solves this particular problem using a particular solution, which I got from there. And I just want to show you that how it works. So what they're going to do is they're going to use, um, how many, how many uh, neurons or uh, neurons are there over here? There is one over here, there's two over here, and three, okay? So we're going to use three perceptrons, okay, to solve this problem. It's multi-layer perceptron. Why do you think it's called multi-layers? Because it has two layers, right? So this is the first layer over here, this is the first layer, and this is the second layer, all right? Um, so um, so the, way, the weights they've chosen are it uses, uh, these are, uh, first set of weights are all one, all right, uh, the second weights that are used in the second layer, which connects the first and the second layer, are, are one and minus two, okay? Now you might say, where did these magical numbers come from? All we're trying to show you is that if you plug in some set of numbers, it can actually differentiate, it can actually differentiate this non-linearly separable problem, which is an XOR problem, okay? And this is just to show you that it, a solution does exist. Now, um, it is not going to use a step function, okay? Uh, it's going to use the, which function is this? The ReLU function, all right? So re rectified linear unit is going to use the ReLU function, all right? Um, so the phi over here refers to this particular solution. So it's going to use phi at both places, at all three places. So in each one of these spots where you're using y1 to calculate, y1 uh, to calculate, uh, sorry, f1 to calculate y1. So it's going to be y1 is going to be equal to phi of f1, right? y2 is going to be phi of f2, and z is going to be equal to phi of g, all right? I sometimes write phi like this, sometimes like this. They're both identical, they're both the same, okay? Uh, can somebody tell me the equation for F1? Now, so F1 is the portion, uh, is the first value over here, all right? This is F1, this is F2, uh, and this is G. So uh, can somebody tell me what is F1, given these weights? And the bias over here is zero. Where the bias is not specified, it's assumed to be zero. X1 plus X2. Right, uh, what is F2? X1 plus X2 minus one because we have a bias of minus one over here. Uh, what is uh, G? Y1 minus two Y2 and there's no bias, okay? So these are the three equations and we've already got the nonlinear activation functions in between, okay? So uh, let's see if we can solve this problem. And I'm going to show you this particular um, uh, table over here. And let's see if, if we plug these values in, uh, does it actually solve the problem? So I have these equations over here. Uh, can people start filling it out? So what is F1 over here? Where you have the first uh, zero. So this is going to be zero. This is going to be one, one, and a two. This is 
also, well, this is has a minus one, so this is going to be minus one. Um, so zero, zero, and a one. All right. Uh, y one is now what? Y one is a ReLU function based on f one. Okay. So what is this going to be? Zero, one, one, two. Okay. Uh, what's y two? Now y two is the ReLU function based on f two. So this is going to be zero because it is negative one. This is going to be zero, zero, and one. Okay. Uh, now g is based on y one minus two y two. So let's do that. Zero. One. One. And a zero. Okay. And now z is based on the ReLU function based on g. So what is this going to be? Zero, one, one, and zero. Cats, dogs, cats. Right? G. So say that again. What's the bi the bias? Okay, ye bias jo hai, This is the bias over here. All right, and the bias basically whenever you have an equation, remember your equation for f is summation of the weights multiplied by the inputs. So these are the inputs, these are the weights. All right, and you have a bias. So the bias is added to the neuron. Okay, so that's the basic equation. So the bias over here is minus one, and your equation for f2 becomes. Uh, x1 plus x2 minus 1. Does that, is that your question? Does that answer your question? Why do we have a bias? Okay, so that goes back to our basic issue. So if we go back to our original problem, remember this particular case, all right? What were we trying to do with the bias? We basically said, or, or if you think about this particular problem where we're saying, okay, we, we wanted the, uh, we wanted, uh, we, when you're looking at the, the example of the cats and dogs, and we said, okay, the value of the weights, the cats and dogs have to be above a certain value. Okay, we said, okay, if their weight is 100 um, you know, kilograms or 100 pounds, is zyada hota hai, so we want it to be uh, a, a considered to be a dog. All right? If it's bigger 100 centimeters, then so we want it to be a dog. But if it's below that, we want it to be a cat. So the bias was actually allowing us, this particular line here, if you think about what we did over here, this particular line, if we didn't have a bias, what would be this equation? What, if, we, if I redo this, let's say, okay, we had uh, this particular equation, and we had cats over here, dogs over here, and we said that the bias was equal to zero, right? So your equation would be x1, plus um, would be x1 plus x2. Your f would be x1 plus x2 plus zero, right? So where would this line be? x1 plus x2, where would f is equal to zero be? Um, f is equal to zero would mean that x1 plus x2 is equal to zero. And tell me what the, what this equa the line would look like. It would basically be the same line, except that it would now be going through this particular point, right? It would have a slope of negative one, and it would be the same line, except that it would now be shifted. So what did the bias allow us to do? The weights actually allow us to shift, to change the, 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 the slope of the equation, all right? And the bias allows us to shift the equation to the left or to the right. So by adding a bias of negative 10, Basically, what we've done is we've shifted this particular line over here to neg 2 plus 10. So this is x1 plus x2 minus 10 is this f is equal to this. This is the shifted version of that. Okay. Uh, suppose we wanted to have a line something like, like this, uh, which has a much bigger slope, a slope of, let's say, uh, this slope, this is a, slope, by the way. 
minus one. What's the slope of this line? Minus one. Uh, what's the slope of this line? Is it greater than what is it is the absolute is going to be probably steeper, right? So it's going to be probably minus two. Okay. So the weights would have to be adjusted so that the this uh, the weights w1 and w2 would would they be equal for this particular equation? No, because uh, the line is no longer symmetric between x1 and x2. Okay. So basically the weights are allowing us to shift the lines a slope and the bias is allowing us to shift the lines position. Okay. So I hope does that answer your question as to why we we having a bias. Okay. Good question, by the way. Um, so, so coming back over here, what we've been able to do is by using a particular bias over here and using a, a different set of weights, okay, we've somehow been able to magically find a solution using what? Three perceptrons, all right? Um, Nonlinear activation functions, which are ReLU, okay? And somehow this is able to solve the XOR problem. Okay. Now again, it doesn't tell you how we got that solution. This was just by way. Sir, I have a question. Magical one. Uh, somebody has a question online. I heard somebody online. If that was just by mistake. That's... Yes. Yes, Abdullah. Yeah. Abdullah, did you have a question? G G G G sir. Sir, your question is that. Right now, we took two variables, x1 and x2. Um, two, and, and we showed that and you drew this small graph at the top right, uh, right. 1, 0, 0, 1. Karke. So if we wanted a bigger space, like if it was 20 by 20, if we wanted that space, like, so then would we need like 20 variables, like x1 to x20 to solve this? So, so the question is that uh, if... Um, move this over here. The question is that suppose that we had a different problem, right? Um, this is our problem. And let's say that we had a whole bunch of cats over here, a bunch of dogs over here, and a bunch of cats over here. All right. So the question is, okay, um, what from your intuition, uh, can we still use a three perceptron? Uh, neural network, a three perceptron based MLP, an artificial neural network to solve this? Or you think it will require something more? Uh, would, we, would, would these three nodes, X1 and X2? Uh, Abdullah, your question is basically that we, we still have two uh, attributes, or are you changing the number of attributes? No, you have absolutely uh, you have so drawn I'm it correctly. your question correctly. You're basically saying that we don't, we still have two attributes, but now we have a larger set of, um, you know, data. We don't have just four data. So we just had zero, one and zero. So we only had uh, uh, four data points earlier, but now let's say we have 400. Okay. But they have a certain pattern. Uh, in other words, they all look something like this. Okay. So the question is, can we solve this using a three perceptron problem? Or will this require um, you know, a much more complex uh, problem, which may be larger number of uh, hidden layers, larger number, a deeper neural network? Um, will it require, um, um, well, inputs, abhi tak sirf x1 and x2 hai, but you could have x1 and x2 uh, connected to a large number of hit, uh, you could have, for example, 20 neurons in the first layer, right? You could have 100 neurons, all of these could be interconnected. So uh, each one of these, this is, by the way, what is referred to as a densely connected network. In other words, every input is connected to every output and every intermediate layer, as I said, these are hidden layers is connected to every subsequent layer, all right? So this would be a densely connected network. So the question is, um, at the end, we would still need to have a single output because we need to have a value of Y, which is either a zero or a one, and you're basically doing a binary classification where you're either classifying it as a dog or a cat, but you could have a much more deeper neural network, right? 
uh, a neural network with hundreds of neurons. So the question is, do you need, do you need something as complex as that or would the simple um, three perceptron network still solve the problem? What's, what does your intuition say? Yeah, I'll tell you something. Sorry? So, so your, your intuition is that because the pattern is still the same, uh, it seems sort of similar to the XOR problem. So the chances are that maybe the three perceptron problem would be able to solve this. Yeah. No, so the, if, you look at, if you look at what we did earlier, all right, uh, does this help you in solving, uh, answering your own question? How many data inputs did we have? We had 16,000 inputs. No, data, these are the data inputs. So you have, uh, this is one data input, right? So this is one particular cat, right? This is another cat. This is another cat, this is another dog. So we had basically six animals, all right? Each one of them had two features, all right? And how many perceptrons were we, were we using? You're only using one perceptron. So the number of variables over here, we've got the number of, um, uh, number of uh, 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 perceptrons, the number of uh, weights, okay? Uh, the number of features rather, and the number of data. So these are all different. And there is, there doesn't seem to be any direct relationship between them so far, okay? So um, it's possible that you, you could have 600 data inputs and you could still solve it using a single perceptron problem, okay, single perceptron neural network. So, so it seems like an XOR kind of a problem, right? Uh, you have this, but instead of having a single zero and a one over here, you could have a whole bunch of data over here, a whole bunch of data over here, and a bunch of cats over here, a bunch of cats over here, all right? So, so, so if I use uh, different colors over here, these could be all the yellow ones, and these could all be the blue ones, right? So basically what we're trying to do is you're trying to differentiate between the blue and the yellow. And since we were able to use a three perceptron neural network uh, configured as a multi-layer perceptron, and that worked, uh, it seems like perhaps this one may also be able to be solvable by three perceptron, okay? Any other thoughts on this, G? You, you think that we may need to have a denser network. Okay. 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 So um, I think those are all good ideas. Now, in order to actually practically look at this, uh, I'm going to take us to um, the playground. All right, the new network playground that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so this is the, the link that uh, let you have that. And let's take a look at this particular network, all right? So um, all of you can just open this. It's very simple, playground.tensorflow.org. Uh, this is made available by, uh, by Google. And it's, it's a really amazing. This didn't exist several years ago, but this allows you to actually experiment, all right? And this allows you to experiment with uh, a lot of stuff. The first stuff that it allows you to do is it selects, it allows you to select the data. Now you can see that this particular data over here is very simple. It's, uh, there are two colors. These are just like cats and dogs. These are orange and blue, all right? So th this particular set, uh, if you look at the amount of data that we have over here, uh, how, much, how much data do we have? Um, well, it seems like we've got a lot, all right? You can figure out the, if you look at the data, you can figure out how much data is. It seems like we've got about 50 or 100 points, okay? So we've got 50 or 100 uh, orange points and maybe 50 or 100 uh, blue points. Now, do you think this is linearly separable? Okay, you can see that the, the solution already is there. 
that you can see that you could simply draw a straight line. And if you see that this is zero and zero, so what do you think is the simplest equation for this? And what would be the bias over here? What would be, what would be the weights and what would be the bias? Uh, bias? Bias would be zero. And what should be the, the weights be? Because it's symmetric, the weight should be one, right? You could make it one, you could make it 100, it doesn't matter, but it's equally weighted, all right? There's no, uh, because the slope is exactly negative one, you can see that, right? Because you can see this is zero over here, and this is zero, and this is going up till plus six and minus six. And similarly over here, it's going from uh, minus six to plus six, okay? Now, um, I'm going to regenerate the data. So you can see that you can regenerate the data and it'll give you different uh, random points, randomly generated, but they all have the same pattern, okay? Um, now, um, it's going to do, um, it's going to find a solution using an iterative method, okay? What it's going to do is it's going to start off by using weights which are random. So right now it's randomly started. When I started this, it's going to use a random weight. This is W1, you might say W11. Okay, which is 0.37, uh, W12 is 0.32, W21 is 0.21, I hope all of you can read this, and W22 is negative 0.043. Where it get these numbers? Completely randomly, chosen between you know, negative 100 and plus 100 or whatever, right? Or negative one and plus, plus one probably. Um, it's got how many perceptrons? two perceptrons, right? So let me change this and I'll, I'll make it simple. I'll make it a single perceptron. You can add layers over here. You can also, for each one of these, you can add, um, you can add uh, within each layer, you can add perceptrons, okay? So this is a really nice network because uh, you, there's a limit to it. I think you can't go beyond eight. The maximum you can go is eight by eight, eight um, in terms of the, the the length of each layer. And in terms of depth, I think there's also a limit. I think you can go up to six. So you can go up to an eight by six fully connected neural network, all right? Uh, let's reduce this to um, plus one and reduce the number of neurons in this particular layer to one. Now, what else can you do over here? Um, you'll notice that there's something called a learning rate, okay? Now the learning rate, you'll talk more about this as you go in detail that basically tells you how fast you want to converge to the solution, okay? Then there's something called activation, which hopefully all of you now understand, right? Uh, what are the options for activation? Now, hopefully all of you can see this. You've got ReLU, linear, uh, linear rectifier, right? You've got sigmoid, both of these I've talked about. Uh, linear is very simple. Linear is just a straight line, all right? Uh, TANH which is another um, non-linear activation function which we haven't talked about, okay? Uh, the default is ReLU, uh, which is the most common. Then there's something called regularization, which we'll talk about later, uh, the regularization rate. Um, then there's uh, the, the type of problem. Now, but basically what we're trying to do is do classification, right? We could be doing regression as well. Do people uh, know what regression is? Regression is where you've got to, you try to fit the best fit. So if you've got a bunch of data and you're trying to put a linear line through that or a polynomial line or something like that, right? There you're looking for a best fit. Um, but uh, this particular problem where we're simply trying to say whether it's a cat or a dog is a classification problem. Now let's say we had goats as well. So we had cats, dogs, and goats, and we're trying to figure out one of those. Is that a regression problem or a classification? It's still classification, but now we've got three categories of animals, okay? So here we're going to be looking at classification. Now, um, we're going to use the default values over here and we're going to start the problem, start solving it. Now I'm going to start it by using a very small learning rate, which means that it's going to do it extremely slowly. Okay, so that you can actually see it solving the problem. So um, let's start it off. Now it started off, by the way, one more thing. It also tells you the output loss, okay? Now, what do you think the loss indicates? And one or two times, the misclassification. In other words, 
if it's classifying it as a cat, whereas in fact it's a dog, so the, the loss is basically a one minus a zero, right? Um, so if it was a cat and you classified it as, as a dog as a one, so you, you, the output, the, the actual output, which we can call y hat, the actual output, output was a zero, but the, the, this, the, the output that the system gave you was a one. It misclassified it as a dog. So the error is y hat minus y. In other words, what was desired minus what you actually got. So the error was what? A minus one, okay? On the other hand, if you had, uh, you know, it classified it uh, in the reverse way, the error would be plus one, okay? So in this particular case, you can see that the, the loss would, in our particular simple case, the, the error was either a, a plus one or a minus one, or it could be a zero, which would mean that it classified it correctly. In other words, you were expecting a one and you got a one, or you're expecting a zero and you got a zero, okay? So that's what a loss is. But now it's doing a loss over all of these inputs, okay? So this is going to be a value not just between zero and one, uh, it will be the average loss, okay? So you can see that the output initially, if I restart it, I'm going to regenerate the data and I'm going to start it again. So, um, I think you can restart it like this. So you start off by having a loss of 0 0.5, which means that you're flipping a coin, right? Half the time you're right, half the time you're wrong. 0 0.5 loss means you it's just a random guess, okay? Uh, you don't even need a, need a neural network for that. You could just you know ask anybody else. You could ask a cat for that matter, right? Or with tote ko na. So uh, you could do that. Uh, as we train this, hopefully the loss is going to become smaller and smaller, right? Now you see two types of losses. You see a test loss and a training loss. What do you think the difference is between the test loss and the training loss? And the hint is over here. Um, the ratio of training to test data. Now, um, right now, the, the ratio for the training to the test data is 50%, which means that let's say you have 100 animals, you're trying to classify 100 animals. What you've done is taken 50 of those and you're saying that I'm going to train, um, that's the break, long. stop for in a few minutes. That's basically saying that I want to, I'm going to take 50% of that data, 50 of those animals, and I'm going to train based on those 50. And now I'm going to test the, the results based on another 50. I'm not going to use the same data, for testing it, but I'm going to use another set, okay? You could change this uh, ratio as well. So here, you could, for example, change the ratio to 70% or you could go to 50%, okay? Uh, typically, this ratio is, you know, 80%, you know, you use 80% of your data for training because um, data is very valuable and you want to use as much of the data for training. And then some of the data, 10%, 20%, 30%, you want to, uh, leave for actually checking how good the results are, okay? You don't want to test it on the same data. So um, over here, it's 50%. So now, in terms of the loss, you think that the test loss is generally going to be better or is it going to be the training loss which is going to be better? You're training on the training data. And based on the training data, you're also calculating a loss. Now you're giving it a separate set of data, which is the test data and you're calculating a loss based on the test data as well. So what's your guess, which should be better? The test data, the test loss should be better or the training loss should be better? Better means a low number. So the training loss should be lower. And when you're testing it because you didn't train it on that, you expect that the test loss would actually be higher, okay? If you train on the, if you, if you train on the less data, so on let's say 10% of the data, and then you're using 90% of the data for, for testing it, right? So what's your question? Will become far more. You know, it'll become extremely more. So uh, depending on the ratio, if uh, on the other hand you trained on 90% of the data and you tested on 10% of the data, then you expect that the, the difference would become very, 
very less because you use the bulk of the data for training it and 10% of the data for testing it. Okay, so you understand the dynamics of this. Okay, so um, let's just run it and see how the results come out. So here it's coming out as you're expecting that the test loss is higher. Okay, you can see that the test loss is higher than the training loss. Uh, it's still very, very high. Okay, it's still 0 0.7, 0 0.47. It's still almost like the, the proverbial tota, right? Uh, let's change the, the learning rate. So I'm going to go to a much higher learning rate. I'm going to keep on increasing it. As you can see that it's becoming a little better. Uh, I'm going to um, make sure that the classification is right. I'm going to make it higher as well. You can see that it's going faster and faster. Uh, and you can see that the differentiation between the orange and blue is now happening, okay? And you can see that um, the training and test loss are almost identical, okay? Uh, because, well, it's 50%. It's also because it's a very simple problem. You can see that the loss is 0.06. In other words, 0.6%. Essentially, almost all of the data is it's classified it, right? Uh, G. Why do we require? Huh? It's, uh, it's not what is required, all right? It, this is the result. G. Lower learning rate, kya baat I'm sorry, okay. So you're saying, ke, uh, pish aap, aapka saath puja, I got confused. Say that again. Rate, okay, okay. That's a good question. Uh, we'll address that in the second part of this lecture, right? What basically happens is that if you take a very low learning rate, suppose we take point triple four zeros in one, what did you see? It was taking extremely long to converge, right? Because it was taking, very, very small steps towards the final result. On the other hand, if I took an extremely large learning rate, 10, okay, um, I'll, I'll restart it, okay? Guess what will happen when I use an extremely large learning rate? It will learn instantaneously, right? But sometimes it's so big that it's actually not converging, okay? So you need to have something in between. So in, in, in other words, in this particular case, you actually see that the test loss is one and the training loss has gone from 0.5 to one. Why is that? Because uh, the result, the solution is not even converging because the, the, the training rate is so high. So uh, 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 let's say we use something in the middle, okay? We use 0 0.03. So it's not extremely small, it's not extremely large. You can see that uh, it's converged fairly rapidly and the result is zero, okay? So the loss is, both the test loss as well as the training loss is zero, okay? So uh, you could see that a, a middle ground was giving you a good result. Question is, why? And we'll talk about this in more detail in, in the second part as uh, hopefully we'll, we'll touch upon that, okay? But, but let's stop over here.